Commissioner, the next witness is Mr Chun. Mr Chun, uh, may I ask whether you'd prefer to be sworn or to make an affirmation? Affirmation, please. Yes, would you be good enough to affirm the witness, please? Thank you very much, Mr. Chun. Do sit down. Mr. Sherry. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Chun, is your full name Peter Chun? Yes. And is your business address 1 Harbour Street, Commonwealth Bank Place in Sydney? Yes. Have you received a summons to attend at the Commission? Yes, I have. We, uh, do you have a copy of that with you? Yes. We tender the summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 5.231, the summons to Mr. Chun. And Mr Chun, have you made a statement dated the 31st of July 2018 in relation to rubric 5.37 in relation to question 30 and section L for Leo in that rubric? Yes. And does that have the document ID number CBA.9000.0108 zero one zero eight point zero 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 one yes are the contents of that statement true and correct sir yes we tender that statement commissioner uh, exhibit five point two three two the statement of mr chun chun dated thirty one july eighteen concerning rubric five dash thirty seven and its annexures Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr Chun, have you also made another statement dated the 7th of August 2018 in relation to sections A to H of rubric 537 with a document ID CBA.9000.0106.0010.0010 Yes. Are the contents of that statement true and correct, <coughs> sir? Yes. Commissioner, we tend to that statement. Statement of Mr Chun of 7 August 18 concerning rubric 5-37, exhibit 5.233. And finally, Mr Chun, have you made a statement dated the 12th of August 2018 <coughs> in relation to rubric 5.68 with a document ID CBA.9000.0090.0010 Point three thousand. Yes. And are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. And we tend to that statement, Commissioner. <coughs> statement of Mr. Chun of twelve August eighteen <coughs> concerning rubric dash five uh, rubric five dash sixty eight uh, five point two three four. Mr. Chun, Mr. Hodge will ask you some questions now. Yes, yes, Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Chun, I want to deal first with the issue in relation to intra-fund advice and the advisor that you've recently, I think, suspended, is that correct? Yes. Now, there's an agreement, as we understand it, between Colonial First State Investments Limited and Financial Wisdom for the provision of intra-fund advice? Yes. Colonial First State is the trustee of the superannuation trust? Yes. Financial Wisdom is an advice licensee owned, I think, by CBA? Yes. And under the agreement, Financial Wisdom is to provide the intra-fund advice to members of the fund? Yes. Intra-fund advice is not personal financial advice? Not the way that CIFSO has um, implemented intra-fund advice, no. No, I'm sorry, not the way that Colonial has Colonial. implemented it. Correct. In theory, it, it goes a bit beyond what might be termed, or could go a bit beyond what is just general advice. That's correct. But you've made the decision that it not go beyond general advice. Yes, we've limited to factual information and general advice. And so could you explain to the Commissioner when a member seeks intra-fund advice, what does that mean? What are they doing? They are generally uh, looking for some help around understanding 
uh, the benefits in their superannuation fund, whether it's to do with insurance, investment options, or making additional contributions, and that could take the form of both factual information or general advice. And would they typically, that is the member, typically contact the fund and then be passed on to the advisor? Uh, no, in some cases, yes, but some, in some cases, uh, Colonial First State has a contact centre that actually also uh, gives intrafund advice. So not in all cases uh, would it be referred to a financial planner. And the particular advisor that we are speaking about, or that your statement deals with, he and his corporate authorised representative, they were, he was an AR of financial wisdom? Yes. And he owned a company that was a CAR of financial wisdom? Yes. And financial wisdom <coughs> subcontracted to him or retained him to provide intrafund advice in what way? Per the contract that SIFSL had with financial wisdom, uh, that particular advisor was an authorised rep to actually provide intrafund advice to the members of our super fund. And does that mean that when the members called up, they would be directed through, in some cases, to his office? Only he would be providing intrafund advice only to the members that are assigned to the employer plans, uh, have which, which has been authorised by financial wisdom. Okay. So, again, just so we can step it through to understand what's happened, First Choice Employer Super is a product within the First State Investment Super Fund? The First Choice Superannuation Trust, yes. First, First Choice Employer Super is a product within the fund? Yes, correct. There are members who are within that product? Yes. Only members within that product would have been assigned over to this advisor? Yes, a subset oh, of the members, yes. yes. <clears throat> How was the subset identified? They are uh, employer plans that the financial planner was servicing, uh, but importantly, has to be authorised by the licensee. So financial wisdom had to assign those employer plans to the authorised rep, and then SIFSL is made aware of that. I see. And again, we're just trying to tease this out. But what we know and you know is that this financial advisor was receiving trailing commission in respect of some of the members that, to whom he was providing intrafund advice. Yes, there was pre-existing trial commission. And was the trial commission something that arose from the employer plan? Yes. Okay. So, and you tell me if I'm not explaining this accurately, there was an employer plan in place with financial wisdom in respect to certain employees of some employer? There were many employer plans, so uh, we have approximately 6,000 employer plans in First Choice Employer and Financial Wisdom uh, and, and their authorised reps uh, had some of those employer plans, that's correct. Financial Wisdom had entered into an agreement with the employer that would allow financial wisdom to receive a trailing commission in respect of employees who went into the Colonial First Choice Superannuation Trust? Uh, so I understand the question correctly. The, the trial commission is only in respect of pre-existing arrangements uh, which have been grandfathered, so no new, no new members actually have trial commission. I understand. Yes. There was an arrangement that had been entered into before 1 July 2014 between financial wisdom and the employer in respect of which if a member went into 
the first state employer super product again before 1 July 2014, there would be trailing commission in respect of that member. Yes. And Financial Wisdom had sold or assigned the trailing commission rights in respect of some of the employer plans it had to the relevant advisor. I wouldn't necessarily uh, outline it exactly those words, but the, the financial planner was authorised under uh, financial wisdom and the financial planner was, was servicing that plan and the trial commission is in relation to the pre-existing arrangement in, in the super fund. And so the trail commission is in any event one arrangement? Yes. And the intra-fund advice is a separate arrangement? Yes. But was, was it the case that the only members in respect of whom this advisor was providing intra-fund advice were those same group of members for whom he owned the trailing commission rights? It's not, there's no direct relationship in that way. Uh, there would be members that are part of employer plans that this financial planner was uh, servicing, uh, but equally there were other plans that this financial planner was servicing in respect of the intra-fund advice. I see. He would have been providing intra-fund advice to both members of the employer plans from whom he was receiving trailing commission and also for members of other employer plans from whom he wasn't receiving trailing commission? Yes. And he made positive contact with members in respect of whom he was receiving trailing commission? That is, he sent a letter to them? In respect of the ADA transfer, yes. yes. And when he did that, and maybe if we bring up an example of that, can we bring up ASIC.0037.0001.0614 Thank you. So there's a redacted bar at the top of the page. That bar, I'm sure you've seen this document before. Yes, I have. And that bar is redacting the name of the financial planning business? Yes. So this seems to have been some sort of email that was sent out by the financial planner to members. Yes. And is this being sent as intra-fund advice or is this being sent by the financial planner as part of servicing the employer plan? This could have been under intra-fund advice, yes. Was there some provision of information by the fund over to the intra-fund advisors of contact details for relevant members? We did, uh, in relation to the ADA migration, uh, provided advisors with a CIFSL template to also communicate to our end members, and that was in addition to our own ADA communications that have been sent to members. 
I see. And this, does it follow the template that was provided? No, it does not. And the issue, it would seem, is that if you look about in the second paragraph, it says around three years ago, the government changed super legislation and it's coming into effect now. As a result, if you don't actively make an investment choice in your super account, you are deemed to be disengaged and the government will make an investment choice for you. And then in the next paragraph, your investment will be moved to a government selected investment called My Super. It is different and may not be best for you. Yes. And as we understand it, Colonial regards those statements as potentially misleading? Yes. And Colonial is also concerned that some of these statements, and there's some other documents which I'm not sure we need to go to, but Colonial is also concerned that these statements may trespass across being general advice into being personal advice? Uh, not specifically that, but more in terms of they could be seen as, as influencing the member to take a particular outcome or take a particular action. And the outcome that they might influence the member to take is to provide an investment direction? Yes. And thereby not transfer over to my super? Yes. Because these communications are crafted in a way that might make a member think that it would be bad for them to transfer to my super? Yes. And in the case of this advisor, In the period from, I think it's 1 July 2013 to 30 June 2017, about 1,380 of his clients elected to remain or gave an investment direction rather than being transferred to my super? Yes. And that was about 25% of his clients? Or you're not sure? Not totally sure, no. And. The concern then, as I understand what you're saying, is first, the communication is not balanced. It doesn't accurately reflect the situation. That's correct. And second, it doesn't disclose the potential conflict of interest on his part in relation to the receipt of trail commissions. That's correct. And third, it's drafted in this way to make the member fearful and influence them to make an election? To influence them to make an election, yes. And you've made, sorry, I withdraw that. The pattern or the history of what has occurred in relation to this specific advisor is that he was initially identified by ASIC, I think last year, is that right? Uh, yes. And he, you received some, there were some notices sent to either CBA or Colonial and respected this advisor? Uh, in February this year, yes. And you may or may not know where things have got to with ASIC? I'm not aware of where it's got to with ASIC, no. And then in July of this year, the Commission issued a rubric or several rubrics to Colonial First State and Financial Wisdom in relation to this advisor? Yes. And then after that, I think on the 26th of July 2018, Colonial then took some steps to seek information from financial wisdom in relation to that member? 
I mean, that advisor? Yes. And then on the 10th of August, Financial Wisdom provided some information. Yes. And then I think very recently you've decided to suspend that member. I'm sorry, that advisor. Yes, in respect of intrafund advice. And what is the connection to intrafund advice if you don't think this contravenes intrafund the prohibition on general advice? I mean, I'm sorry, the contribution, the prohibition on personal advice. Uh, because in in the contract, uh, there's a there's a need to actually ensure that this type of general advice is actually uh, balanced and, and is not misleading. Uh, so we are concerned in respect of this set of communications and we decided to take action to suspend him going forward, servicing our members. And I think from the most recent version of your statement, or the finalised version of your statement, you've expressed the position of Colonial First State to be that it considers that the conduct of the advisor and the corporate or corporate authorised representative may be misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations. Yes. And also that the conduct of financial wisdom, if it's established that it involves a contravention of any financial services law then it would amount to misconduct? Yes. And that Colonial First State considers that its own conduct in relation to communications with ADA members, but I think just in respect of this advisor, may have fallen below community standards and expectations? Yes, it's, it's in relation to all our communications uh, with the ADA. We I felt think. now, having reflected on this, that it would have been uh, a good thing to call out this conflict uh, of trial commission. I understand. The particular matter of concern and where Colonial considers it may have fallen below community standards and expectations is that it didn't say to advisers that you ought to disclose your conflict of interest to members? That was one uh, aspect that I, I believe we should have, as I called out in, this, in my statement. And then the other aspect in my statement is also our own ADA communications to members. Uh, it would have been good to make that conflict uh, known to our members. And then... Colonial also considers that its delay in investigating the matters in relation to the advisor fell below community standards and expectations. Yes. And finally, as we understand it, Colonial is going to require financial wisdom to refund the fees for intrafund advice. Is that right? Uh, in my statement, it's in relation to a specific issue we identified um, and upon when I reviewed the actual fee payment, we be it became uh, clear to us that when advisors were not providing the service, uh, our systems did not actually refund that fee uh, or, or apply a, an adjustment. And so in respect of the last four years of financial wisdom advisors, that's amounted to $48,000. And we're taking steps now to investigate other groups uh, that may have a similar issue. Uh, so we've identified that as a, as a process failure and we're taking steps to actually address that. But it's a, a adjustment from the licensee that we're looking to uh, claw back this payment. Yes, it's this is what I wanted to understand. Yep. It's an adjustment as between Colonial and the licensee. Correct. 
the member doesn't pay separately for intra-fund no. advice. You're not proposing to give money back to the member? No. And so the conduct that may have fallen below community standards and expectations of colonial in respect of this failure to provide services by financial wisdom, what is, I don't understand, what is the conduct that you the think? The specific conduct we uh, were looking to draw out here was that there wasn't a service being provided and we had paid fees to financial wisdom, which we've now subsequently identified. And so in that respect, the community would not expect us to be paying fees and hence um, in preparing my statement, I felt it was appropriate to call out this process breakdown in our way we were making these adjustments. Do you think the community would expect that if you have charged to members an administration fee that includes the provision of intra-fund advice and no intra-fund advice has been provided, that you would make some refund to the members? Uh, no, I don't. It's, it's a, a complex matter. I'm, I'm happy to explain uh, how, how it, it, we've thought about it. So the whole premise of intra-fund advice was to make advice available to all members. And when this concept was introduced in 2013, uh, we followed the, the ASIC guidance around a collective charging model to actually spread those costs across all members to make uh, the service available and, and more cost effective. And so that was how we looked to have uh, the service being part of our administration fee rather than being borne by the member on a, user base, on a user pays basis. We felt a collective charging method uh, versus a user pays method was the most effective way to actually make this advice available to all our members. And hence um, your actual question about if there was a, uh, an amount that wasn't uh, being paid by Colonial, should members have actually uh, received a, a refund, uh, in, the, in, in the scale of what we were paying, this is actually less than 1% of the total fees to financial wisdom. And in terms of, we always look at fee reductions to our members in line with overall cost reductions, uh, but this is one of many different types of services that the trustee provides to our members. And there's no explicit reduction in fee in proportion to this payment reducing or, or this cost not being borne by the trustee. Has the advisor complained about being suspended? I'm not aware of it. This was communicated uh, to Financial Wisdom just recently, so I'm not aware of any, any uh, feedback to, the, to this point. By recently, was it this week? Uh, yes. Last week. Oh, it, last week. Last week, and then in terms of our decision in SIFSL was last week, yes. and then we communicated to Financial Wisdom uh, on the weekend, I believe. And do you know, is there any contemplation within Colonial of there being consequences for management of Colonial of having over the course of at least a year and probably longer misled members in exactly the same way to cause them to think that they ought to make an investment decision rather than going into my super. Can you please just um, re rephrase that question? Do you agree with me that Colonial itself, in communicating with members, made representations to them that were misleading in an almost identical way to this communication from the advisor because they would have caused members to think that they ought to or needed to 
make an investment decision? No, I don't accept that. Okay. Commissioner, oh, I tend to that document, Commissioner. Template financial planner email concerning important superannuation changes, ASIC 0037 0001 0614, Exhibit 5.235. And there's been no internal review within Colonial of the manner in which it communicated to members about uh, the ADA transition. We've reviewed the communications and on reflection, this uh, element of the trial commission conflict, we felt we should have uh, included. Have you more generally reviewed the communications made by Colonial to members who had ADAs about whether they should or should not make an investment decision? In the course of preparing my statement, I have reviewed uh, those communications, yes. And you don't hold any concerns about those communications, save insofar as they fail to disclose the conflict? Uh, no, I don't. I believe they were uh, fair and balanced and described the difference between uh, the My Super product and the Choice product. Have you discussed that view with Ms Elkins? No, I have not. She hasn't expressed a different view to you? Uh, this is the view that in preparing my own witness statement uh, that I believe is correct. Okay. I want to then move to a different topic, which is the selling of Commonwealth Essential Super, which is something you've also given a statement about. Yes. Were you involved in the development of that product? Yes, I was. Okay. Now, the development, or I'm sorry, the selling of it occurs pursuant to an agreement, which we might bring up, which is cba.0001.0398.3229. That is exhibit PC-1 to Mr Chun's statement in response to rubric 5-37. Which date statement? Sorry. It's the statement dated the 26th of July 2018. So this is the distribution and administration services agreement? Yes. And it's an agreement between the bank and Colonial First State? Yes. And the effect of the agreement seems to be that CBA will provide certain services to the trustee, which is Colonial. Yes. And Colonial is going to establish this particular, or has established this particular superannuation fund, which will include the CES product. Yes. And if we go to page 30 of the document, which is dot three two five eight. We see a description of what the services are and what the fee is. So the, the effect of the services is that this essential super product will be sold by the bank through its branches? Yes. Was it envisaged when it was first established that the only members of the product would be members who came through the branches or through CBA's distribution network? That was the original target market, uh, and at the same time, it was coinciding with the introduction of my super. So it was a low-cost, simple superannuation product uh, for CBA customers. Yes. And the fee is that the bank will be paid 30% of the total net revenue earned by the trustee in relation to the fund? Yes. Is 30% of the total net revenue a high fee for distribution services? I can't comment on high. I can give you the, the reason we agreed with the bank, uh, the 30%. It was based on the costs 
that the bank incurred and versus the costs that CIFSO incurred. So we had a, an, an assumption on the costs of the trustee and the costs of the distribution, and it was broadly 30%, 70%. So 30% being CBA and 70% being CIFSO. It was an, it was an assumed uh, cost allocation. And presumably that would include a profit margin for both. It would. It would. It, well, the concept is we uh, collected the total fee from members, and that fee was split 30, 70, based on the costs incurred in the respective part of either the bank or, or in CIFSO. So, yes, if, if you're implying that, then in turn there would be a profit within both the bank and in CIFSO. And the, the net revenue, that's actually the gross revenue? This is um, some internal terminology, but it's based on uh, net of any external investment management fees that we might pay away. So it was based on, on that as a concept. So this was a product set up on the basis that it would be a new product and 30% of the fees would go to the bank for selling the product? Yes. And was there any suggestion that there was internal analysis to show that this product would perform better or be lower cost for members compared to other available products on the market? Uh, yes, as I've said in my witness statement, the pricing strategy of this fund was always uh, intended to be uh, in the top quartile. So we, we took the My Super Universe and in re relation to Chart West, we used the Chart West research uh, at different account balances. We wanted to ensure it was priced very competitively, and so it was uh, top quartile, meaning the the most competitive fees in the top 25% of all my super funds. And what about performance? Was there any performance ambition for it? The performance of uh, and again, this was the My Super uh, product where we launched a life cycle strategy, which varies based on, or the asset allocation uh, of the fund would alter during the life of the member. Uh, so we had a, a, an in investment objective that we set uh, for a brand new fund. And since launch, it has actually exceeded its target investment objective. Is every My Super fund has managed to exceed its investment objective over the last four years, hasn't it? I can't comment exactly, but, but, in, but in our case, we uh, look at how has it been performing against what we uh, had indicated to our members, and we certainly are satisfied that it's performing in line with the objective and, and exceeding the objective. Sorry, I, I said every, I withdraw that. Do you know what in, how in general my super funds have performed over the last few years against their investment <coughs> objectives? Uh, in general, I believe they would have um, performed in line with, with their objective. Our strategy was quite different because we did life cycle and and we, we couldn't, you cannot necessarily compare to some other My Super funds that just has a single default investment strategy. Uh, for us, we were very focused on making sure ours uh, was appropriate for our members. And then, if we just understand the process of developing it, can we bring up CBA.0517.0176.2000? Um, so 
So this is an exhibit to your statement. This is a presentation that you gave to ASIC. Uh, yes, can you just refer me to my exhibit? Just yes, so it's I can PC see the whole... 2, Mr. Chun. creating this product, went and told ASIC about what you were doing? Yes, we did. And can you explain to the Commissioner why you told ASIC about it? Uh, we recognised at the outset that uh, there were potential risks around the general advice uh, distribution model of, of potentially blurring into personal, as well as uh, this was a major undertaking of CBA around a, a new superannuation product, a new distribution model. So we felt as a trustee it would be prudent to consult the regulator, get clarity on the using general advice as the right distribution model. And again, the other important element here was this was also the time of FOFA, where FOFA, um, one important aspect was of FOFA was the government's intention to make advice accessible and affordable, and they were uh, advocating uh, general advice as a way to help meet the needs of more customers or, or more, more Australians. And with those two initiatives, the introduction of My Super, being a low cost, simple superannuation product, as well as the FOFA regime of advocating uh, for a general advice model, those two initiatives we embarked upon designing a new fund and, an, and a distribution model and in 2012 we engaged the regulator to actually make sure that uh, they were comfortable with the way we embarked upon a, a general advice distribution model. I'm told that Your statement may have exhi different exhibit numbers from my Yeah, no, I found it. I, you found the right one? Oh, yeah. good. I, I was just wanting to make sure I had the whole deck. And if we go to page dot two zero one one. <coughs> so this is, again, this is all part of what you're explaining to ASIC that a customer is going to come into a branch, the person, the customer is going to say, for example, I'm starting a new job. Then the person in the branch will say, congratulations on your new job. And then start trying to create an interest for the member in taking up a CES product. Is that right? Yes. And that's for an individual, and then if we go over the page to dot two zero one two, this is the same type of process, but it's being described now for dealing with an employer customer rather than an individual customer. Yes. And then you went back and spoke to ASIC again in February of 2013, and that's CBA.0517.0176.2019. Which is, in my version, exhibit PC-3. So you went back, gave them yes. another presentation about what you were doing. Yes. And then on page 2023, You explain, for example, how you're going to uncover customers, the customer need for essential super. Yes. And one of the things you identified for ASIC was as part of the customer interaction, that might be either a customer transaction or the financial health check 
or customer request or referral? Yes. And then I take it at the time ASIC didn't object to you going ahead with the product? No, we um, walked them through all the screens, all the scripting. Uh, so these meetings were to ensure we had the appropriate guidance from ASIC uh, because we, we felt that this was a, in the general advice space, was an important area of the legislation that we wanted clarity. That is, you wanted to know that they weren't going to suggest that you were breaching the prohibition on providing personal advice by what you were doing? Uh, no, so specifically we wanted to design a model that uh, was based on general advice and that was important when the government advocated a simple super, superannuation regime of my super. So we felt that there was a safe place to use general advice uh, and it was on that basis we specifically designed the process uh, with a general advice um, distribution in mind and was seeking ASIC's input along the way, as you can see in these multiple sessions that we had with ASIC. And you brought the product into effect in, what about July of 2013? Yes. And then about 12 weeks later, you had KPMG do a mystery shopper project in relation to the product? Yes, and that was actually uh, one of the elements that when we went to ASIC, we had already indicated to them that we would be doing a series of mystery shopping to help make sure we were addressing uh, those uh, general advice risks um, where appropriate. <coughs> We bring up CBA.0001.0463.6783. So this is the report from KPMG after that initial mystery shop? Yes. And if we go to page.6785, This is the executive summary of that first shop. Yes. And the first shop identified that there are a high volume of compliance exceptions. Yes. 85% of shoppers were not provided with a financial services guide. Yes. 40% of shoppers were not provided with a PDS. Yes. 95% of customer service reps did not follow the application process in detail. Yes. 85% of shoppers were not provided with a general advice warning as part of the inquiry sale. Yes. And were the results of this provided in 2013 to ASIC? No, not in 2013, no. Not until 2014? Yes. And then you continued to do mystery shopping. I think you've referred to it in your statement. You did one at the beginning or the end of 2013 into 2014. Uh, the second mystery shop was conducted in December 2013. Yes, and then yes. reported on in 28, on 28 February 2014. Yes, that's correct. And the third mystery shop was conducted in September 2014 and reported on on the 3rd of December 2014? Yes, that's correct. And I'm not sure, would it be, would you say there was some but not a lot of improvement in terms of compliance? If I go back to uh, what's on the screen, the first mystery shop, they were 20 branches, and though it was not a random sample. So those were 20 branches uh, which had late uh, sales training. So we, were, we had specifically identified uh, a subset of branches, and we're talking about 1,000 branches of CBA, so 20 of them we chose. 
and these results were concerning. Uh, we immediately took steps to send out communications and, and videos to all branches and all staff uh, to specifically focus on following the, the sales approach. Uh, and then in the next second round of Mystery Shop, we did see an improvement. By then it had expanded to 45 branches. Uh, and again, there were areas where there was general advice warnings weren't given or no financial services guide given. Uh, however, when we analysed um, the 45 sales, because they, they were only 45, we were satisfied that they were not um, uh, areas that we had concerns with. And uh, uh, one example being FSG, not giving an FSG. Uh, many of these customers were CBA customers. So there's actually an exemption because it was the bank's FSG or CBA's FSG. So even though the, the outcome was high in terms of not actually meeting that, when we analysed the specifics, it actually was not uh, uh, an important element of that, that particular sale. But notwithstanding that, um, off the back of the first two mystery shop, we did further changes to the sales approach, uh, and particularly around the need to have a general advice warning, which, as I said at the beginning, was an important element of the control. And so not only were we relying on the verbal warning, but also we included a written warning. So we took a number of steps to make sure that improvements were made. You're finished? Yes. The concern that ASIC had in particular was about the use of the financial health check along with recommending essential super. Uh, that was in later period when we became aware <laughs> that ASIC uh, was looking at the financial health check, but that was not uh, back in 2014. Okay, I believe it was around 2015 onwards. Initially, when they were interested in it in 2014, they were just concerned generally about the model, were they? Uh, they were not concerned. We went to them to lay out exactly our approach. Uh, and then off the back of that, we indicated we would be doing a program of mystery shopping to help us tighten these controls, uh, which we subsequently sent a good governance letter to ASIC in December 2014. ASIC issued you with a notice on the 28th of August 2014? Yes. And that was the first of a series of notices? Yes, it was. And presumably in that notice, they identified some matter of concern that might constitute a contravention? Uh, not specifically at that time. Uh, my recollection was that at that time they were seeking information on uh, branch staff sales, member accounts. There was no uh, specific area that we could see. We were responding to their request for information. Uh, my recollection is the financial health check that they started investigating that was 2015, 2016. I'm not aware back in 2014 they, that was an area that they had requested of CIFSL. It was information, it was asking information to be provided. And then by either the end of 2016 or the beginning of 2017 they were suggesting they would commence a proceeding? Uh, yes, we were aware that they uh, had concerns and I recall during that period every time they had indicated there was an area of concern we took steps to make a change and, and one specific change that we did in the model was remove the ability to consolidate superannuation funds in the branch and have it as part of once a member is part of the fund, it would be something that they turn their mind to or they uh, contact our contact centre to better understand how to consolidate. And so in, I recall in January 2017, we took the action to uh, remove consolidation from branch.
So if we just cut to the end, do you know what happened between October 2017 and July 2018 in relation to the negotiation of an enforceable undertaking? Yes, I was aware um, the bank was in dialogue with ASIC in relation to an enforceable undertaking. But you weren't yes. directly involved in those negotiations? No, I was not. Okay. Does it seem strange to you that it would be impossible under FOFA for a superannuation fund to enter into an agreement with a financial advisor where they will agree to pay 30% of their revenue to the financial advisor if the financial advisor provides fina personal financial advice to a member of the public. And that leads to the member of the public going into the fund. But it's apparently fine for a fund to pay 30% of its net revenue to a bank to recommend to a member of the public or attempt to suggest to a member of the public that they should join the fund? As I outlined before, uh, this was a new product, a new distribution model. Uh, the trustee felt the, the fairest way to determine uh, a fee to pay the bank was on the basis of costs incurred. Uh, that was the, the approach we in SIFSL but took. But it's, it's not on the basis of costs incurred. It's a revenue sharing arrangement. It's a revenue sharing in terms of the basis of the payment is expressed as a percentage of revenue. Yes. However, the way that was determined was on a An fair approximation of costs, costs model. Because it was a new offering, a new distribution model, uh, the trustee felt this was the fairest and most equitable way to strike a, a fee arrangement with the bank. Somebody working in the bank isn't under a best interest duty in relation to the member, or I'm sorry, in relation to the customer? Uh, not in terms of general advice. I'm not aware that that's the provisions of best interest um, applies in a general advice model, but I could be wrong. And when this person in the bank is offering general advice, it's envisaged that the effect of that advice will be that the customer should join CES. If it's appropriate for the customer, I mean, it's, it's factual information or general advice, but we, we felt that for the branch staff, uh, they often would need to respond to uh, benefits of consolidation, benefits of additional contribution. But only because they've raised superannuation in the first place. That's correct, yes. And what's envisaged by this model is that inevitably, whatever is said in the branch is going to lead to a member joining the superannuation fund. If it's appropriate for the member, yes. But the person in the branch isn't attempting to make any assessment of whether it's appropriate for the member. Uh, that's exactly the, the general advice regime. Um, we were not recommending other products uh, to the customer. We were making them aware of uh, this particular superannuation offering. I don't have any further questions for this witness, Commissioner. Thank you. Mr Sherry? No re-examination, Yes. Thank you very much. Mr Chan, you may step down. You're excused. Commissioner, Mr Donnelly is taking the next witness. And we have a changing of the guard, do we, Mr Donnelly? Um, if I come back at 10 to 1. Thank you. <laughs>